Batman, a mysterious and adventurous figure, fighting for righteousness and apprehending the wrongdoer. In his lone battle against the evil forces of society, his identity remains unknown. <laughs> To the comic book artists uh, at the beginning of comics, the city represented a stage set. Because people fear darkness, light represents safety, darkness of course represents danger, and so there is nothing more frightening or threatening than a dark alley or a shadow falling across someone's face. Gotham City is one of the most wonderful notions there ever was. It's uh, New York City below uh, 34th Street. And it's, it's a place where the buildings are far too close together. The streets somehow vanish when you hit the rooftop so you can jump from one building to the next. All of us were living and working in New York. We kind of got the beat of the, of the city. It was the center of everything, including crime. It's a place that is essentially satanic in its dark caves, its, its corners, its shadows, out of which um, evil things come. And, and so therefore, um, an equivalent power has to, uh, has to fight them. Everything with these characters, the heart of them is always wish fulfillment. And it's almost always a mistake to think of them as human beings. You have to define the wish and, uh, and then play it out. In the case of Batman, beyond the, you know, the obvious fantasy of being able to leap from rooftop to rooftop, which I've always wanted to do, uh, you've got the idea of having the power over the criminals, of, of there being something out there that the criminals are frightened of. The source of the Batman uh, uh, as a character uh, has been argued for many years. Uh, the, the people who actually created him, uh, Bob Kane and Bill Finger and, and, and Dick Sprang and people like that who drew him, uh, most of them talk about The Shadow. Now, The Shadow was a very, very popular American radio program uh, in the 30s and 40s. In fact, Orson Welles was the voice of the first Shadow. <laughs> in the hearts of men. <laughs> the shadow knows. The shadow became a master of darkness, a man no one knew his identity. Eventually on the radio, they simplified it so he became Lamont Cranston, this wealthy playboy. When the image of the Batman was originally created, they said, well, all right, let's have a creature of shadows like that and they discovered that uh, calling him the Batman would work. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, a Bruce Wayne whose uh, parents were murdered and uh, he was influenced by a bat that flew into, the, uh, uh, into his, uh, his drawing room one night and he said, this is a creature that, uh, that criminals will fear. Batman's unusual. He's unlike Superman. In fact, he's unlike any superhero because he's human. That is to say, his powers are those that anyone studying karate for 11 years and pumping some iron and running wind sprints would come into. He has certain things that we don't have, for example, immense wealth, vast scientific knowledge, and so forth. But still, flesh and blood can die from a bullet very easily. That's one. Two, psychologically different. Superheroes are, as well they might be, given such extraordinary powers, reasonably unflappable people. Superman doesn't much get mad. Batman gets interested in this business because his parents are shot to death, mother and father, by a burglar on the street. He's a vindictive son of a bitch and is from the get-go, which is to say Batman is ill-tempered, there's genuinely dark stuff in him. He's interested in frightening people all the time. Don't kill me! Don't kill me! Don't kill me, man! What are you? I'm Batman. Batman comes from a darker world, and the newest and very successful Batman stuff done in the 80s 
essentially works with the material that was latent there all along, a noir element. We had just came out of the uh, 20s and 30s. The villains of the time were the gangsters, the Dillingers, the Pretty Boy Floyd, um, that whole series of bank robbers and so forth. And uh, Batman really, in the beginning, was combating that kind of crime. Uh, he also had a streak of vigilantism. You know, Batman was doing something that the police force couldn't do openly. He could work behind the scenes. So that kind of gave him an aura of an outsider, yet but on the right side. Early 30s, there's a lot of popular romanticization of genuine gangsters. It's prohibition. It's pretty scary. There's a big depression on. Dillinger's a folk hero. Capone is a hero. I think that Batman, along with a great number of other comics, are an attempt to render the forces of order heroic in a period where the forces of insurgency had become a little too heroic for everybody's comfort. Somehow we had a, an awareness that we were working on a new medium. It was like the early days of the film, I think maybe is the best analogy. Because everything we did was new, it hadn't been done before. Uh, the first time you know, we did a sequence uh, uh, compressing time, or the first time we did a, expanded the size of the panel to give a, a, another kind of illusion and uh, other storytelling techniques. So. Uh, Creatively, it was very exciting. Comics were bought by publishers who regarded cartoonists as very replaceable people. These cartoonists had no name and no identity. So uh, when a, a publisher acquired a uh, comic book character, which is what, the way they call them, a character, he owned it outright and then was free to hire other people to draw on it, as in the case of the superheroes that we know about, like Batman and Superman, who have had numerous artists ever since the origin of it, uh, uh, totally under control of the, of the publisher himself. You had to write a lot of stories in order to make any kind of money at all, and it was exhausting. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't keep using the same gimmicks, so he would get together with a couple of the other writers on the staff and some of the artists and they'd sit there and they'd brainstorm all weekend and you know I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd hear the typewriter go. The Batmobile, the, the Batcave, the Penguin, um, the Bat Signal. Because at that time in New York they used to have searchlights in the skies looking for enemy planes and for theater openings, you know, you always have the searchlights going like this. Bill Finger was a very humanistic kind of fellow, very soft, gentle, and uh, a talented writer. And he brought to Batman, from, again, from where I saw it, uh, a, a, a kind of uh, humanism that uh, a character like that sorely needed. Any of my father's stories were over, always characterized by oversized things. This, I, I'm sure, had a great deal to do with the 1939 World's Fair, where uh, they had giant typewriters and giant telephones. Um, the first television, prototypes for computers, new concepts in aircraft, things that turned up in Dick Tracy as well, miniaturized television like and wristband radios. And it gave a man with ordinary powers super capabilities. Um, he liked the fact that the world was changing. He was born in 1914. The old world was rapidly disappearing. High atop one of the hills which ring the teeming metropolis of Gotham City, a large house rears its bulk against the dark sky. Outwardly, there's nothing to distinguish this house from many others. But 
deep in the cavernous basements of this house, in a chamber hewn from the living rock of the mountain, is the strange, dimly lighted, mysteriously secret Bat's Cave, hidden headquarters of America's number one crime fighter, Batman. Yes, Batman, clad in the somber costume which has struck terror to the heart of many a swaggering denizen of the underworld. Batman, who even now is in the plans of a new assault against the forces of crime. A crushing blow against evil in which he will have the valuable aid of his young, two-fisted assistant, Robin the Boy Wonder. When I came into the studio, Bill and Bob were already talking about adding a boy. Uh, the only thing that I added was the name because they were thinking of various names like uh, Mercury and some mythological names and none kind of struck me. We had maybe 30 names. And uh, I finally suggested Robin. I've been accused because my name is Robinson that it was, they go with me, but that was not so. I was thinking of Robin Hood. And when we designed the costume, uh, as you'll see, it's a variation of the classic Robin Hood costume. And I remember I added the little R signal on his vest, which corresponded to the bat symbol on Batman. I think what they were trying to do was appeal to kids, you know. You gotta remember that the whole model for everything was Superman standing there with the big American flag behind it. You know, truth, justice, and the American way. So when they put this cape and they made Batman look evil, I think they had to say, well, we gotta make him safe now. We've gone, we've made him look from the dark side. We made him look a little evil. We made him this anti-hero. How can we get the kids to go along? We'll have him have a sidekick who's a young kid. You know, so show that he has a relationship to young people or something like that. But of course, you know, then everyone thought, what, what's he really doing with Robin? <laughs> oh, I wonder, I love you. Holy Guadal Canal, Batman. What now? Hi, kids. It's me, your pal, the boy wonder. Taking this opportunity to catch up on my fan mail. Even as a boy wonder, it's really hard to read all the tons of mail I get. Here is a happy letter from someone just about your age. Dear, cute, wonderful, fabulous, magnificent, exquisite boy wonder. A cold chill runs up my spine every time I see you sock a villain. And oh, Come in, Mike. Please sit down. The Batman type of story helps to fixate homoerotic tendencies by suggesting the form of an adolescent with adult or Ganymede Zeus type of love relationship. Batman and Robin, the dynamic duo, also known as the daring duo, go into action in their special uniform. They constantly rescue each other from a violent attack by an unending series of enemies. Sometimes, Batman ends up in bed, injured, and Robin is shown sitting next to him. At home, they live an idyllic life. They are Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. Bruce is described as a socialite. And uh, the official relationship is that Dick is Bruce's ward. They live in sumptuous quarters surrounded by beautiful flowers in large vases. They have a butler called Alfred. Sometimes Batman is shown in a dressing gown. It is like a wish dream of two homosexuals living together. It's every boy's dream, isn't it? To you know, forget about mommy and daddy. You know, they're 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 just happily killed off in an accident, and you have this wonderful superhero to act as your father figure. You get to go on adventures with him. I think it's innocently homoerotic, actually, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's a period that young boys well, I don't think there's anything wrong with homoeroticism, to tell you the truth, but there's a period that boys go through where they really don't want anything to do with girls. I mean, in, in, in simpler ethnic societies, they used to live in the boys' house, and the women would live in the girls' house, and they didn't want anything to do with each other. It's, it's a stage they go through, and this is for very much attracts boys of that stage. 
In these stories, there are practically no decent, attractive, successful women. The typical female character is the cat woman who's vicious and uh, uses a whip. If the girl is good looking, she is undoubtedly a villainess. And if she is after Bruce Wayne, she will have no chance against Dick. To me, the strongest character in Batman has always been Catwoman. And she's, for one thing, because she's an outlaw, she's actually allowed to have a stronger character. This is, it's very ironic, but the nice girls, of course, always had to be kind of weak. There's really Batwoman and Batgirl. Batwoman was earlier, and she was, um, Kathy Kane was her name. We have this alliteration, and Kathy Kane, Lois Lane, Vicki Vale, they, they all had those kind of names. And she was a society woman who, in fact, dated Bruce Wayne, and maybe that's why their names rhymed. She had things like she would blow the powder from her compact into the eyes of the bad guys. I mean, she would fight them in these little womanly ways. The bad girl is uh, Barbara Gordon, who is the daughter of Police Commissioner Gordon, this is Batgirl when she started. In fact, this is the origin issue. But very, very quickly she became trivialized and they did these really silly stories with her. Like in this one, she's got to run in her tights so she can't fight. They trivialized the female characters very quickly. Very often among superhero characters, if they have a girlfriend, she very conveniently gets killed. I think it reflects a desire to basically get rid of and be done with the female characters and, and get on with a world that's totally male. American heroes uh, can't have mature relationships. It's in the nature of the beast. Um, the American hero can't grow up. If he grows up, the complexities of good and evil um, overtake him. Women represent these complexities. Society, um, which women bring to the, Amer to the American hero, confuse him. So it's far better to withdraw from women and to keep the issues of good and evil very clear and separate. They represent American youth who love their country and are glad to fight for it. Wherever crime raises its ugly head on, let's get out of here. with the venom of a maddened rattlesnake, Batman and Robin strike also. And in this very hour when the Axis criminals are spreading their evil over the world, even within our own land, Batman and Robin stand ready to fight them to the death. Now I'm going to satisfy a curiosity I've had for a long time. Are you Jeff devil? Got to find out who the Batman really is. Kids begin to get some money in the 40s. It's a tight labor market. Families tend to bust up under the stresses of war. Certain increase in criminality, generally. In fact, crime's been increasing, we might want to say, with very few interruptions ever since. They certainly notice it. Now, there's two kinds of attacks on comic books. There's a right-wing, largely Catholic attack, is what I would call an authoritarian liberalism with a psychoanalytic bump, which is Dr. Frederick Wortham in the rather famous book, The Seduction of the Innocent. You get a fusion of these two tendencies, and as a result, Senate investigations. In this comic book is a love story, a boy and girl in love. They get married. And after an offensively lurid description, illustrated, of course, of the couple's wedding night, the book shows how the bride murders her husband by chopping his head off with an axe. This comic book describes a sexual aberration so shocking that I couldn't mention even the scientific terms on television. I think there ought to be a law against them. The effect of this is to produce a kind of hysteria about comics, very much like the hysteria about television in the 60s and 70s, and to some degree about crack now, which is to say a tacit assumption that without some gross, novel, disturbing element from without, 
kids would be different. But they're not reading anything constructive. They're reading stories devoted to adultery, to sexual perversion, to horror, to the most despicable of crimes. Horror and crime comics upset kids. I'm not talking about any subtle distortion of their emotional makeup. I think that occurs too. But there's a more noticeable, immediate effect. You can see the tension develop as the story gets more gruesome. And if it's a bad one, the kid has a mass of jangled nerves by the time he's through it. Now, the effect of this was to elicit the threats of legislative action and in turn to get a self-regulating cartel going. The comic books decided to issue seals to comics that conform to their code. Most of the, of the basic assumptions of, of comics up until the past few years were all pretty much set in the 40s and then, and then thoroughly castrated in the 50s was a little bit sprinkled in the 60s of, of more contemporary issues, but essentially it was graven in stone. And um, in the 50s, and, and everything had to happen in a very benevolent world where you can always trust the cops, you can always trust your elected officials, you can always trust your parents. Um, I, I think that, that it's unfortunate that for so many years the basic idea of superheroes was made impossible. Um, by, by putting it in a world where, where it didn't need any. What happened in the late 50s is that science fiction elements crept in, I think quite explicitly in response to Sputnik. Sputnik was the Soviet satellite that gave Americans a tremendous math and science panic. So Batman deals a lot with mad scientists, renegade scientists, X-rays, Y-rays, Z-rays. In the 50s, everything got a lot more optimistic. There was a, a, a belief in traditional values, which does not square very well with a guy who hides his face and runs around after midnight. Uh, so Batman became a kind of scoutmaster. He was frequently seen in the day walking down the street. Nobody seemed to pay any attention to this guy in a cape and mask. On a city street at three in the afternoon, the stories were light and cheerful and, and science fiction-y. Uh, again, uh, reflecting what I think was the uh, great popular interest in science and technology of that decade. DC Comics, which were what Batman and Superman were, were in the 60s, I thought, quite dull. Batman was in the least interesting period of Batman ever. It, it, it's not a period in which people in American middle classes and in American suburbs feel particularly menaced the early 60s. It's an expanding economy, everything's just Jake. Gotham seemed, period, it was campy, it was 30s, campy in spite of itself. It wasn't campy from a deliberate choice. <laughs> Very simple idea, on land. very simple Seed. idea, which was to air, so overdo it that it would be funny, and it would be exciting for kids on a, on a daring do basis, and humorous for adults on a rather subtle, campy basis. I don't know who he is behind that mask of his, but I do know when we need him, and we need him now. We had deliberately put one line in the pilot script that really was the key to whether or not this was going to be funny to adults. If you remember, Batman comes into a nightclub in his silly outfit, and the maitre d' comes up and he says, ringside table, Batman? And he said, no, 
I'll just sit over here. I wouldn't wish to appear conspicuous. Well, you know, if you don't laugh at that, you're never going to laugh at anything. Stand clear. You go first. I'll anchor you. Roger. Gosh, if I could just figure out that riddle. Why can't I? Batman was really about acting out, wasn't it? I mean, it was, you know, kind of acting dumb and getting away with it and going with your baser kind of uh, the TV show now. Um, you know, adults didn't act on dumb on American television at all. Uh, they weren't allowed to. Everybody had to be this great moral influence, you know. Then with Batman, it was kind of like saying, you know, I mean, adults liked it too. It was kind of like, you know, people started having fun. Your orange juice, sir. Batman special. I accept your invitation. The villains were not, uh, they were not serial killers. They were not people who went out and raped someone in the park. No, no, no. These were villains who had bizarre plans and plots and whom the public in Gotham City was not frightened of because they were never after the public. They were always after a Stradivarius violin. In the case of one of the shows, they were always after Batman and Robin. You also notice that you, nobody was ever shot, nobody ever bled, and at the end of these magnificent fights that they staged, the villains would get up. The main idea about the Joker was to have a villain who had a sense of humor, which is kind of a contradiction. All the villains were very straight, you know, they were all bad, you know, was, there was no immediate ground. And so this gave him another dimension, which I think that was made it exciting. Jack is dead, my friend. You can call me Joker. <laughs> the villains have to reflect the hero to a certain extent. In this kind of story, Batman is, is a classic control freak bringing order to a chaotic universe. I mean, his antithesis is the Joker, who's a total symbol of chaos. Wing freak terrorizes. Wait till they get a load of me. You also have villains like Two-Face, who again is a reflection of Batman. Two-Face is a district attorney who half of his face was scarred by acid um, and uh, split personality, who, uh, would, would either work for good or evil, depending on literally the flip of a coin. Um, again, someone pursued by inner demons. It's a double identity. Savage urges. Robin was a victim. You could tell Robin was a victim all along. He knew Robin was going to die. I mean, he knew Robin could never fill the shoes of Batman, right? I mean, he was always going to be this... Now, everybody hates second place, you know? I mean, he was always going to be second place. Dick Grayson had a falling out with Batman, um, went off on his own and became Nightwing, and became a, the leader of his own group of superheroes, the Teen Titans, which for a long time was DC's most popular book. New Robin was Jason Todd, who was a street kid, who stole the hubcaps off the Batmobile. And Batman followed him home, was really intrigued by a kid who would have guts enough to do that, and found an orphan. And eventually thought that the kid might be a good successor to Dick Grayson. The kid didn't work out very well, I'm afraid. That happens now and then. For some reason, Jason Todd was not as popular as his predecessor and there didn't seem to be anything we could do to make him that popular. So I had our writer, Jim Starlin, uh, create a continuity which would eventually put Robin in terrible trouble. And at that point, the readers were invited to call in. One number for he lives, one number for he doesn't live. 
phone company didn't want us to say dies. And right up until 8 o'clock on Friday night, which was the cutoff, it could have gone either way. I got the final tally at 8.30. The kid had indeed not made it. I have heard that one guy in California programmed his computer to dial the kill him number every 90 seconds. So if that's true, one guy made the difference. Everybody wanted him dead. Everybody wanted him dead for years, you know? I mean, we, you know, because Batman didn't need Robin. You know, he really didn't need him. I, I, you know, I felt that, that there was no way to really do Batman without addressing the fact that, you know, at least at the start of the story, he's an anachronism. I mean, he's like Zorro. There's, there's something very antiquated about the whole notion, and, and, and the effort of Dark Knight was to revive it. it. It wasn't to bury the idea, and it wasn't to kick it around the block a few times and, or, um, or do an autopsy. It was, to, it was to make the idea work in a modern context. In the 80s, artists like Frank Miller said, let's actually create a completely 80s reality that's recognizable. People are watching TV shows, they're living in cities you've heard of, they're facing nuclear crisis, there's famine around the world. And as soon as you do that, the figure of Batman becomes far more interesting because he then isn't living in a timeless world. He's actually living in a world where his actions have consequences. We got the idea to do, uh, to do a, a you know, 55-year-old Batman uh, about a year before I actually started the book. Uh, I, the idea had just popped into my head that, that, that what if the character were as old as his legend? Part of the Batman myth to me that's always appealed to me. When I was a little kid, Batman was about 30 years old. Now that I'm, now that I'm 32, at the time I was 30, um, Batman still had to be at least 20 years older than I was for me to accept him as the stern father. What Frank Miller did was he actually took something that had actually been turned so completely ironic that you couldn't imagine anybody taking it seriously and said, let's tell the story straight with passion and conviction as if it were a real romance, a real, a, a real story where Batman becomes a man, not a, not a comic book figure. Let's, let's actually take the implications of the story that were always there and let's act as if we're, tell we're writing a novel. The closest thing I can come to probably in, in coming up with a comparison is the character of Dirty Harry that Clint Eastwood invented, which is coming up where the story is actually about the drama of someone who's basically a proto-fascist, which is the complex story of somebody who's trying to fight evil, but whose methods are themselves virtually indistinguishable from the evil. And Miller took that, the drama of that seriously, and all of a sudden the Batman story took on far more power and resonance than it ever had in the preceding 48 years of its life. What makes the new Batman so impressive is that everybody now has a more lively sense of how terrifying cities are. They know that cities are violent. They're much less optimistic about the kinds of people who live in cities. Uh, they're able to imagine a much darker world. The cops in an 80s Batman are implacably corrupt on the take from drug money, uh, murderously violent themselves. The inner city is terrifying. The forces of order are incompetent and corrupt. There's nothing sentimentalized in The Dark Knight Returns. It's a place that's been run by extortion, crime, and violence, you know, as long as we can remember, and that's been the scenario. And that, we hope, is reflected in the design of the town. But when it came to actually designing the buildings themselves or the, the town itself, we went for no time. We went back a hundred years and imagined how New York might have developed had there been no planning permission. In New York, get zoning to get lights into the street, we would have done the opposite. We cantilevered it in so that there's, you've really got this horrendous chasm. We described it as, as, as the Gotham City as though hell has erupted through the pavements and just carried on growing, you know. As a, one of the more amusing ways of really sort of attacking the problem, you know. By the, by the time we reach the Batman of the movie, Batman has actually gone through lots of transformations, and the interesting thing with the movie will be to see whether or not they actually keep the 80s sense of him or make him into a 
guarantor of law and order, the ultimate policeman of the status quo. What's happened in Hollywood over the last decade is that it's cost so much to make the average movie that everyone realizes that you're, it's a much wiser investment to spend a lot of money and hope to make a lot of money than to spend just a little money and hope to make a little money. And so Batman becomes a sort of quintessential Hollywood movie of the 80s in which you're spending $50 million in hopes of making 250 or $300 million. <laughs> Vale. Bruce Wayne. And what do you do for a living? <laughs> Lieutenant, is there a six-foot bat in Gotham City? You look fine. I didn't ask. If you're going to tie up millions of dollars, you want it to pay big investments. And the way of doing that then is to come up with huge cultural extravaganzas of this kind that can then be sold in all sorts of ways. Because Batman isn't just a movie, it's already a line of merchandise that's being manufactured in factories all over the country right now. Artists had no equity in what they did. Uh, and this was not only the, uh, the fault of the publishers, but the whole artistic, creative, cultural society regarded comic books and comic art as the very lowest level on the ladder. And so artists began, comic book artists uh, couldn't help but regard themselves as very low on the ladder. So no artist had the temerity, with the exception of one or two, uh, to uh, say to a publisher, look, I want equity in this property. If he did, the publisher said, well, go somewhere else. Since then, I produced shows at the art galleries of, of cartoon art. We never thought of it in those terms, or I, I guess we would have saved all the original work. <laughs> and most of us then were very uh, uh, unaware of the nuances of protecting our work. Uh, we just, unfortunately, we just didn't think about it. And so most of the copyrights and the ownership uh, uh, was retained by the publishers. But anything we didn't specifically ask for back was destroyed, unfortunately. Now some of them are invaluable. Because it was a popular medium, it was denigrated. Because it was not in the great tradition of Western literature, you see, it was thought uh, a throwaway form, which is why comic books today are, are as valuable as they are. Because mothers would literally take the comics out of their kids' hands and say, this will rot your brain, and they would throw them away. Michael! What are you doing down there? It's very late.